Hey everyone, welcome. This is Garden Fork Radio, the eclectic DIY show. We have a podcast and a YouTube channel. My name is Eric and I'm here with my buddy Rick. Welcome, sir. Uh, good morning, Eric. How are you this this fine morning? I'm great. It's it's not snowing and uh, it's going to get really cold tomorrow, but today it's beautiful. So what the heck, you know? You bet. It uh, got pretty cold here last night, I think around 28, which uh, is cold for this area. Yeah. So, uh, but it kills those ticks and fleas, and that's what we want. You know, I listened to a podcast called, I listened to it uh, regularly, it's new Gastropod. Yes. And um, fair, just wicked smart people, a lot of, uh, clearly do research, unlike our podcast. And they were talking about olive oil and counterfeit olive oil, but related to climate change, which I believe in, um, in Italy, they're having a big problem, not just Italy, but the Mediterranean having a big problem with their olive trees because it's not getting cold enough to kill a fly that lays its eggs in the olives. And Jeez. so in the southern, by the boot of Italy, whole olive orchards are being wiped out by this fly because it lays its eggs and the larvae grow in the fruit. And the fruit, and it is a fruit, by the way. Right. Um, so they can't use it for olive oil. And it's because they don't get any frost anymore. It's too warm. Oh, dear. Well, that's that's terrible. But that's the kind of thing that uh, you know, we'll notice first about uh, climate change. Uh, you know, we know that uh, uh, the uh, mosquitoes are creeping up the sides of mountains as they get warmer. And uh, people yeah. that were living up above the mosquitoes are now uh, having to uh, move even farther if they want to get farther up, if they want to get away from the mosquitoes. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't, know, there, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there will be climate change winners and losers, but all in all, it's going to be a great disruption. So I'm uh, I'm actually happy that it frosts and freezes. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we got a bunch of stuff to talk about. I want to talk about the Instant Pot and some video feedback. We have some viewer mail about uh, growing apple trees from seed and acorn flower. Right. And uh, the Fedco seed catalog is out. I wanted to talk about that and um, and whatever Rick has on his mind. OK, well, I got a couple of things I, I wanted to toss in about the pears and the apples uh, growing from seed. And well, if we get a little time about the uh, near field communication chip, which I'm kind of excited about. Well, let's read Andrea's uh, email. Andrea and her husband and I, I'm blanking on their name. They just sent me a nice Christmas card, too. And they sent me last year this cool wooden plaque that I have in my shop. It says, done is better than perfect. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so she writes uh, from Andrea, hope things are good with your family. I know it's not the garden season, um, but do you know anything or have ever done a video about starting fruit trees from seeds? We have pear and apple seeds. We'd like to start a mini orchard. I just noticed we missed a couple of videos you put out. Looking forward to watching them and learning more. Keep up the great videos and have a Merry Christmas. And that's from Andrea. Oh, well, and Merry Christmas to you, Andrea, and your husband, yeah. too, your family. Um, I guess you want to be the John Chapman of your neighborhood. Do you know who John Chapman is? Was that Johnny Appleseed? That was Johnny Appleseed. Um, unfortunately, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Apples and pears do not come true from seed. Uh, they Pears are a little more likely. They're actually in the same. They just developed the uh, pears off into a new genus. The apples and pears used to be together, and then they were subspecies sort of each other. But um, they moved the pears down to a new genus, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, they will not come true from seed, and pears have a very long juvenile period. Uh, it'll be five years before you get flowers, ten years before you'll get um, fruit, more or less. And that that's a long time to wait. And then you don't know if it's going to be a good pear or, or a rock-hard pear or a sour pear, that kind of thing. Same thing for apples. Uh, these are all traditionally grown uh, in orchards from a, a root stock and then grafted on. And uh, it's usually so they have better. A, they have a tree that they like, so they take a twig from that and they glue it onto a rootstock and they start a new tree. Right. And uh, you want a rootstock that's hardy for your area. Andrea doesn't say where she is, but um, a rootstock that's hardy for your area. And interestingly enough, one of the most common rootstocks for uh, pears is the Bradford pear. 
which I, I thought was very strange. It's an ornamental. It uh, was sold in this area after we had a blight that wiped out all the uh, flowering trees. And it's a terrible tree to own uh, as far as a, a full-size tree because the angle of the, uh, of the uh, limbs is too narrow. And any wind will just split off huge pieces of a Bradford pear. But uh, they do use it for rootstock a lot because it's very hardy for many areas. And then you go find a, a pear that you like or an apple that you like and graft that onto the, uh, the uh, rootstock. So uh, you can plant them if you just want uh, shade and if you're just interested in experimenting and you have plenty of time to wait. But if you want to, uh, she says orchard here, and I'm, I'm going to kind of take that to mean that they are interested in uh, getting uh, cooking and eating apples. Uh, they're not going to be very good, or your chances of getting one are not very good. Uh, so you'll need to, um, you know, consider that. Uh, probably the best thing to do really is just to go buy, uh, um, you know, little trees that have already been grafted and plant those, uh, get them from a nursery. You can order ones that are special for your area. The uh, This is a great segue into the new Fedco catalog that just came out. Um, ah. But Fedco also has a subdivision uh, called Fedco Trees, and they, are, uh, they do a deep dive into your standard apple trees and heirloom apple trees. They have a whole chart about which ones will grow where really well. Almost all their trees are, well, they're like saplings. They're like three to five foot long saplings that have been grown from rootstock. And they are grown in Maine. So they are they are cold hardy. No and kidding. they will also list where, you know, other, you can also email them and just ask them questions and they will reply. Um, so go to fedcoseeds.com and then click on the, there's a, a button there for the tree catalog, which you can download a PDF or scroll through it online. And I've ordered trees and shrubs from them. I actually just ordered some winterberry bushes from them uh, to oh, supplement nice. the ones I have. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so there you go. The, the flip side of this is that some very interesting apples have been discovered by what are, I think they're called sprites. I think when your apple tree, you know, drops off apples and then some little apple trees grow from that. Sometimes people are like, well, let's just let that grow and see what happens. Um, and usually it's a bust. They're called pig apples around me. Um, they're apples that you would want to sell. You just, you just feed them to your hogs. But I think a couple of very popular apples have been discovered from Sprites. And oh, one wow. of them yeah. might, might be the Newtown Pippin. Um, which is a cider apple. But anyway, the flip, so we're, the, the gist is buy saplings that um, are hardy for your area and maybe try a couple from seed and there might be a happy accident, but it's going to be 10, 15 years down the road for that. Yeah, exactly. You know, the other thing a lot of people don't know about uh, uh, non-hybrid pears is during their juvenile period, they have some really nasty thorns. And they're big and they're long and they're really sharp. And that helps them survive deer and rabbits um, in their growing stage. But uh, they're, they're a real pain to have around because they'll drop off as well and be in the grass. Oops. If, Oops. You, want, if you want some uh, a good couple of videos about this, um, Will from the Weekend Homestead has quite the orchard that he planted a year or two ago with some nice drone footage because I'm excited by drones now. Um of course. And he, he, um, he's been on the show. And um, so to go to the Weekend Homestead on YouTube, he's also very active in our Garden Fork uh, Facebook discussion group as well. You could ask him on there. And Andrea is on our Facebook group as well. Okay. So. And uh, if you're interested in the uh, Garden Fork Facebook group, it's uh, Garden Fork uh, q and I think, isn't that what it's called? I'll link to it in the show notes. It's, it's yeah. I got to think up a better name for it because it's, it's not very searchable, actually. You can find the Facebook, the Garden Fork Facebook page, and then it'll say somewhere on there, join our group. Yeah, and it's a, uh, it's a, a walled garden. It's closed off. The only reason we do that is to keep uh, the spammers out. Uh, so just, uh, you know, click on, apply to join, and, uh, you know, we, we'll get to you pretty quick. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent of the Instant Pot, but I've been having some issues with cooking uh, pork shoulder with it lately. 
Oh, really? And, you know, you, know, you owe me a uh, Instapot uh, yogurt video. I'm working on that this week. It actually it takes quite a while to make yogurt in the Instant Pot. You have to start at about seven in the morning, and seven in the morning I'm usually walking the dogs. So, uh. um, well, it takes it takes about. 10, 11 hours. And so if, unless I don't want to shoot the, I don't want to shoot the end of the video at nine o'clock at night because I don't look very good at nine o'clock at night. So, <laughs> but my, I've cooked two pork shoulders based on the, um, the time suggested on the instant pot site. And it has come out, come out, you know, it's supposed to be this fork tender thing that you can tear apart with a fork and make pulled pork. And it's not, it's, it's kind of cooked, but the, the, the collagen and fat and all that, I don't know what the, the, the fatty parts haven't melted to make that unctuous tender meat. So oh. I don't know if I'm overcooking them or undercooking them. Uh, but, and I have, and I love that. I just made white beans with the instant pot actually, and they came out fantastic. Um, but just, what do you all could you help me? It's radio at gardenfork.tv. I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I have no idea. It's great. What I love is, uh, like last night, I was like, oh, let's have uh, beans tomorrow. So I literally take a bag of Goya beans, and if I forget to brine them, it's no big deal. I just throw them in the pot. I I fill it with two inches above the, two and a half inches above the, the, the beans of water. I throw in three garlic cloves, and I hit on. And then it defaults to, I think, 30 minutes. I can't remember, but I bump it up by five or 10 minutes because I didn't brine them. And then, uh, you know, an hour later, and it makes a happy sound. And you've got cooked beans with kind of a garlicky flavor to them. Wow. And you know, from I, I the... don't have one yet. I, uh, maybe, oh. maybe Santa will be good to me this year. All right. I'll talk to Gail. So, <laughs> um, What's cool is I was listening to the Gastropod podcast about olive oil, and they said something that I really agree with, that um, white beans, navy beans, or cannellini beans, with just some olive oil drizzled on them and a little bit of uh, Romano or Parmigiano Romano or Pecorino cheese is an amazing meal. It's just white beans have this great flavor, a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of cheese, and it, it feels like you're in Italy. You know? Oh, wow. <laughs> I wonder if it'd work with uh, lima beans. That's from my part of the country. Yeah, I love lima beans. I love baked yeah. lima beans with, a, with a, like a pork product in there. Yeah, yeah, nice and creamy smooth. Oh, now I want lima beans. Yeah. Well, let's see what else we got here for uh, uh, reader mail, listener mail. Oh, there's one from Kathleen. And I don't know if Kathleen listens to the podcast or not. She's on her email list and she watches the YouTube videos. But she is way smarter than Rick or I. I maybe she's a, maybe she a scientist? Um, um, she might be. I made a video about asking people what I should make. What should I do going forward? What kind of videos do people like to watch? Because I think that's a great, it's a great way to get feedback. And the feedback was phenomenal. Um, yeah. And Kathleen wrote, I was thinking... Uh, I was thinking that if you'd send me your address, I could send you enough of my acorn flour for you to experiment with making some bread with it or some other recipe. The process of making acorns into flour is pretty lengthy, though it's not really that much work. But I imagine some of your viewers might find it interesting to see you give it a try and just to find out that acorns can be made into food for humans. Isn't that interesting? I had heard about this. I couldn't imagine myself out there wrestling squirrels you know, to, to get the acorns. <laughs> But uh, that that would be interesting to hear to uh, to do. Well, we've had it. This is this year has been a bumper crop for acorns, and that usually means that the deer and turkey populations will be healthy through winter uh, right. around, at least by us. But you can, I Kathleen clearly knows more about this than I do. But from reading my foraging books, um, Lady Merith, Meredith actually goes in this in her book, is that. Some acorns can have a worm in them. So you you lay them out. I don't know if you uh, break open the acorn shell and just have the acorn meat, but you have to lay them out in a way that the worm will exit the acorn and then you can bake them or dry them and then you ground them. And you have to soak them in some water because they can be, uh, is the word astringent? Anyway, yes. I'm kind of... 
I'm kind of giving you the big overview, and uh, I'm sure some acorn flower experts are yelling back at the podcast right now. So, well, that, that, they can write in and let us know where we're wrong. That happens a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but people—it's really amazing how many people have um, uh, responded when you put out the call for uh, you know what to do about your hoop house that was kind of collapsing. Uh, that's probably more. Uh, listener mail or, or TV watcher YouTube mail than we've had in forever. And that, you know, we really appreciated all the suggestions. And uh, then you did your uh, sitting on the floor video. Yeah, and, me in the uh, labs. Yeah, you in the labs and, and the ball stuck under the stove and <laughs> ball stuck under the, the uh, dishwasher. dishwasher. And <laughs> I would just like to, I'm, I'm kind of bored with making straight up how-to videos. And I've been mm, doing it. I can understand that, yeah. Uh, the camera rapper had pointed out that I've been doing this for 10 years, which I didn't realize. <laughs> I didn't either. Because we started, should, we started when Henry actually, was young. So Yeah. yeah. You, when speak about people who are a lot smarter than we are, uh, you married well, my friend. But she, she's a lot <laughs> smarter than either of us. Yeah. And the hard part is she's so busy with work that it, it's um, she can't run the camera nearly as often as I would like. So, but I like... I was given a, I was gifted a drone that I'd like to have more. I just would like it to make it a little more cinematic because that actually is my background. Uh, right. I used, I used to work in TV and film. And so, but I still want to keep the Eric, Ericness to it. So I'm just going to make what I like. And that's really kind of the gist of a lot of the response was follow your heart. Um, and uh, I don't know if Noreen from Noreen's Kitchen listens to the podcast, but. Um, she kind of summed it up really well. And she says, you know, just, you know, we, we like what you are doing. So. Well, they also said they like you, which yeah. I think is wonderful. Um, you know, you got a lot of love from those and that's wonderful. Yay. Yay. You know, um, Steve wrote in and he says, uh, can I suggest something? I've been thinking about this for some time. Perhaps invite your listeners to upload a two to three minute video of their hacks fixes and rebuilds and incorporate it into your show. I think that's a pretty good idea. And uh, on the uh, Facebook side, anybody can upload a video there. If you're a member of the uh, discussion group, I put one up just the other day um, about, uh, I added a double wall to my uh, uh, garden greenhouse, my little mini greenhouse. Yeah. Uh, so it'll stay warmer and uh, hold heat a little bit better. Uh, I wondered if I, had overdone it and it wouldn't be appropriate for this area. You might have to be farther north to really get good use out of that. But uh, it was interesting to do and it was kind of fun. And uh, I've, I've already had uh, two people watch it. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Rick. I'll bump it up. I'll bump it up on the list. So, uh, But, you know, it, it was easy to do and it was a lot of fun. And um, I'm not, I have to learn to aim the camera at my face um, <laughs> and, and talk to it. But uh, it was first one I've done in a very long time, and uh, I just wanted to uh, do it. You know, it's it's the hard part is trying to talk to the camera, do the work, troubleshoot, and and manage the camera all at the same time. You know, that's that's the really hard part about some of these projects. Yeah, it's um, there's a lot of craft involved. I like how Steve said here. He goes, I have a couple of ideas I'd like to submit. My own camera operator has no idea yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll do that because we could. I could create a Dropbox, and then people could. We could make a YouTube video. You know, people could upload. You know, they could send it to me by Dropbox, and I could. I could edit them all into one video and put it on YouTube, and on Facebook, and that would be fun. Yeah, it really would. And uh, you know, uh, a lot of the people that responded to your um, request for ideas uh, had some great ones about uh, you know they'd like to see recipes and uh, you know cooking more cooking that kind of thing and also crafts. Um, I'm not a particularly crafty person, but uh, uh, you know there are a lot of people that are. Get out your glue gun. <laughs> going to shop on Amazon, would you consider using our affiliate link? That gives us a little finder's fee for you going to Amazon and buying stuff, and it doesn't affect the prices you pay. It just gives us 
a little finder's fee. It helps us pay the bills here. So if you want to use the link gardenfork.tv slash Amazon, that'll take you directly to Amazon. But it has a little tag in it that says, hey, Eric from Garden Fork sent me. So go thank Eric. And I thank you for using that. Gardenfork.tv slash Amazon. There's a link in the show notes as well. But gardenfork.tv slash Amazon goes a long way to help us. All right? I went to the town holiday fair upstate and um, my neighbor uh, was running one of the uh, tables of, um, she says, Eric, she goes, the glue gun with the dog food is amazing. And I'm like, uh, context, 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 you know, <laughs> I'm like, what is she talking about? Cause I'm dumb as a rock. And she said, I watched what your mousetrap hack video. And she goes, and it's brilliant. Cause uh, actually our dogs were born in her garage. Um, she is oh. a hobby Labrador breeder, but she has this big mouse problem. So I took, my idea was to take, it wasn't mine. Someone gave me the ideas, put small dry dog food and hot glued onto the little bait tang of your mouse trap. And um, it's, it works a lot better than peanut butter. And so it, it does actually, it works pretty good. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, uh, I, I missed that part somewhere. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> do, um, do, have you seen one of the several videos online about why you should water your Christmas tree in your living room? I know why you should, but uh, uh, go the ahead. The dry one goes up real quick. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I had a, a friend who was a uh, fire investigator, and he says, you know, Christmas tree fires are about the only thing we can't call arson. <laughs> so if you let it get dry, <laughs> too dry, and you want a, everything to go up, poof. Uh, it's about the only thing you can get away with, they say. Yeah, put your kid in charge of watering the tree every day, you know? Yeah, yeah, not um, your dog. <laughs> But there's uh, there's a video on Lifehacker. I saw uh, it's actually the uh, uh, the federal government put out a pretty compelling video showing a dry Christmas tree and a well watered Christmas tree. And they, uh, there was a small electrical fire with the lights, and uh, the dry Christmas tree went up like a like a Christmas tree, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know. And I put a a link up to a, a little video about not uh, plugging. Um, uh, space heaters and that kind of stuff into uh, um, power strips because they really don't have the ability to, to uh, handle that much current. No, and, it'll uh, overwhelm lot, it, yeah. Yeah, a lot of a lot of fires from those things going up. Ex yeah, it seems like extension cords uh, and little space heaters, not good. Right. So uh, I've been uh, doing a deep dive on the 99% Invisible podcast and their website. Um, Isn't that a great thing? Just just brilliant stuff. And um, the guy's voice, he's just got the radio voice, you know. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> but they have a website with a bunch of articles on it, um, which sometimes touch on the same topics. But if you're if you geek out about like urban design, you know, um, and design in general, but kind of design how it relates to the everyday world. It's pretty phenomenal. And the most recent article I read on their site, they write two of them a week, I think. Uh, the guy's name is Kurt that writes the articles. Um, Kurt Anderson. Is about how a neighborhood kind of um, engineered, they, re, they redrew a dangerous intersection using cornstarch, and tree leaves. It was a kind of a big, a th there's three roads that come together and it's a very wide intersection that was confusing. It almost looked like a rotary that's not a rotary without the without the middle, with the middle gone basically. Right. And they used cornstarch to redraw the traffic lines, the sides of the road, you know, cause the sides of the roads are usually uh, lined with white. And they put two white bars across. They didn't put up stop signs, but they put a white bar across the road. And people usually stop at that because they see a white bar. And then to cover up the asphalt that they wanted to um, keep people from driving on, they put down leaves. How you know, interesting. Like leaves off yeah. the tree. And it worked so well that the city took it the right way and is going to redesign that intersection. But it was kind of... Uh, 
you know, I don't think you should go out and be redrawing highways, but um, that was pretty. It was pretty neat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it sometimes it's real interesting what uh, a few determined people that have good ideas can uh, get through. Well, I um, paint the hydrant. This we call it the stripe, the hydrant rectangle around the fire hydrant on our block. Right. Because the city, because of budget cuts, they just don't send somebody out to do that. They used to do it. They don't do it anymore. And I, so I went out and I asked my neighbor buddy to help me. And he's like, well, I'll come, I'll come watch. I'm not going to have the roller in my hand so we don't get arrested. And I'm like, you know, everyone thinks when I do this, they think I work for the city. Uh. <laughs> and they go, they almost everyone goes, oh, thank you for doing that. But they repaved our road, you know, and so that my stripes disappeared. And as soon as that happened, there are some less than nice people that block the hydrant. They hide it with their giant truck or something usually overnight ah, because they, they right. it's hard to park trucks. And I'm like, you're endangering people's lives by blocking a fire hydrant, which I find just unconscionable, you know? Of course. So, But I paint this yellow stripe and you go to the big store and you buy Krylon orange or yellow striping paint. And it's an oil-based paint that's made to go on asphalt. You wait for the street sweeper to come through on your alternate side parking day. And then you... I, I do the rectangle according to the code. It has to be 15 feet on either side of the hydrant. And then I put up milk crates with uh, yellow tape to keep people from driving on the. And it dries in a couple hours, and I've done my... Um, Your civic of, duty. Yeah. yeah. But it's a See, pass. Is that a, it's called considered a passive behavior change. We're trying to change behavior without without yelling at them. We're just kind of like, here are these lines. Don't park yeah. here. Yeah, and, and without bothering the police about it. Um, you know, that, that really works out. Well, I'm proud of you, Eric. Yeah, that's my, uh, so it's, it's 99% in, it's, I think it's called 99pi.com. And, uh, the podcast is great. I don't know. I'm just kind of doing a deep yeah. dive on that when I'm in the car. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's just about all it's nine, 99% invisible. And the reason it's invisible is it, they're showing you all the thought and the work and the uh, things you s take for granted every time you see something, uh, uh, some sort of a building or a foundation or, um, you know, all kinds of things, uh, bridges, uh, you know, just all the things that go behind it and into the uh, the making of it. And sometimes it's really small things and sometimes it's, you know, big projects. But uh, I find it fascinating. He's done a really good job. There's a related uh, site called Web Urbanist, which has some pretty wacky stuff on it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and the most recent post I saw on there was um, a couple that have built a nuclear fallout bunker out of school buses that they buried in the ground and covered with concrete. That's a little wacky. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we started to uh, move once uh, and retire up to uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. And we looked at a house that had a fallout bunker that the guy had made himself and uh, actually uh, was using dynamite. He'd blasted holes down into the, uh, through the, uh, the uh, dirt to uh, get himself a well. And then had carried all that the debris out in, in a bucket, you know, just pail by pail by pail. And uh, I, I thought that was a little too much for me. So we, we passed on that house. <laughs> You'd probably just have to worry about that flooding, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it was uh, actually right next to a, um, a uh, old school that had been converted to a house that uh, Thomas Jefferson built for his um, everybody on the uh, his properties to go to school at uh, when they were uh, little kids. So it was a kind of interesting part of the country, but it was just a, a little too horsey and a little too... Uh, uh, too much for me. And, and frankly, I'm glad I didn't take on all that work. Yeah. Now you're in the neighborhood where everyone looks at you going, what's with that guy, Rick? Oh yeah. They, I, I've been doing my usual, uh, leaf gathering. My, my neighbors dutifully, uh, bag all their leaves and, uh, I go by and pick up their bags and I lay them out, run them a uh, mulching lawnmower over them and I pile them up into a big bin. I've got a wire bin now full of uh, neighborhood leaves and I'm creating leaf mulch and uh, you know, throw a couple of handfuls of fertilizer in there and keep it watered, turn it every now and then. And I'll have a uh, wonderful uh, uh, mulch to put down this, uh, this spring. I asked in our um, weekly email, which goes out most weeks, um, about, I have a lot of oak 
leaves and whether just mulching them into the lawn was okay or does that acidify the soil and a couple couple people wrote back and said you want you don't want 100 percent oak leaves going into your lawn there um mm. either you want to mix or you shouldn't have just just oak leaves in there or you could you could counteract it by liming you know putting lime down so right you know um yeah, my neighborhood has such a variety of trees. Most of them kind of ornamental and stuff. I don't have to think about that. Um, although I do um, uh, uh, top our beds in the spring with um, uh, pine uh, needles. Right. Yeah, pine needles. Yeah. So you know they and they're lightweight and they hold together because they got little barbs, and so they don't wash away real easily. And so that's uh, you know uh, something that I uh, I watch. My neighbors and they they're very good. They'll segregate their pine needles into a different sack, probably because they're they're raking in a different area, different part of the yard. <laughs> and I'll, I always watch for pine needles. It's like there's that guy. There's that guy. That neighbor Rick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've got people trained now. Some people will drop their uh, uh, bags of leaves off at the house. Just leave them on the curb. Do you drive so, the uh, Prius around, or do you have like a little tractor with a trailer? Or well, I use a, a trailer on my bicycle. Uh, oh great! A lot, a lot of the time, and uh, if I'm just driving by and I see them, I'll throw them in the back of the uh, the Prius or or the Matrix, and uh, you know bring them on home. But a lot of people just learn to bring them down to me. I, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> Good for uh, you, man. The the Tom Sawyer school of uh, of uh, gardening, I guess. Hmm. You know, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about briefly because oh, I've been not fast- these microchips. <laughs> oh. <laughs> or is that is another thing? <laughs> well, that's, an, that's actually a, 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 another thing. I wanted to talk about a subset of microchips, uh, near field communication chips, and they're coming out in a lot of the phones. Uh, if you have a, a an Apple after five C, I think you you get one, and you can register your credit card and your debit cards whatnot in the wallet inside there. But one of the things I, I mean, everybody has them now. Samsung's got one. Um, you know, the, the Google phones. Just everybody has a, their own kind of little system. But what is amazing about this is how secure it is right now. Uh, I uh, have started using the near field communication chip for everything I buy at the store because it does not pass your credit card information to the uh, the vent the uh, retailer. Uh, it takes your credit card and the serial number on your microchip, adds some math and a random number or something, and creates a pseudo credit card number. And that's what's passed to the uh, to the uh, merchant. It wow. also passes a one-time uh, use code that is the that verifies it. And so even if somebody were to um, intercept, that signal and it's hard to do because it's you know it's very high frequency and it's just real uh, very low power and you have to touch the uh, the reader to uh, make it transfer uh, it just it's a one-time code and it uses a, a pseudo credit card number and how it works in the background is all kind of uh, mysterious to me but you know if you want if you're really interested in securing your stuff uh, that's not a bad way to do it. And like I say, all the phones, uh, the newer phones, have a micro, uh, a near field communication chip. And I, I, th- I just kind of find that whole technology fascinating because I wish they'd do something like that for my online purchases as well. Oh yeah, because yeah. I, you know, I did have my identity stolen, and um, there have been many break-ins to the credit card information of the large retailers. Right. And so this using this. The retailer does not have your credit card information. Right. And if you have a uh, an Apple product and it doesn't have the near field communication, if you install the wallet, which is just a little app, and put your credit card in there, and you have a uh, a uh, one of the new Apple watches, it has a near field communication chip in it, and it will convert your old cell phone to uh, let you use the chip in your, your, uh, in your watch. In the watch, yeah. Yeah, and do the same thing. And it, it just seems like that's the way to go because uh, the one place I've noticed they don't have uh, near-field communication chips, which you would think it'd be a no-brainer, gas pumps. 
Yeah, I, yeah, because oh, yeah? That's, the place, that's the place where you see the card skimmers a lot when you read the news and you kind of keep up with that. Um, people stealing your uh, credit card identity by putting a skimmer on a gas pump. You know, So when you pull in to get gas, uh, always look to make sure all the uh, slots where you put your card in look the same. And I even give the one I'm going to use a, a little tug to see if it's going to come off because they're just stuck up there with two-sided tape. Oh, smart. And, uh, yeah. And uh, just to see if, if, it, if it has an external part that you can pull. But um, if you had near-field communication, there would be no more uh, uh, skimming your card. Or when you uh, – uh, your card uh, – you give the card and it walks away when you're uh, uh, at a restaurant or something. Uh, a lot of the restaurants I have been going to lately have a, um, uh, a credit card terminal there at the table. It's wireless. And it, it uses near field communication, so you don't have to worry about a waiter or waitress uh, uh, scanning your card while you're uh, not watching it. And so I, I kind of like the idea. Oh, good. I, I didn't know what we were going to talk about. Well, I, went, I knew you wanted to talk about chips. I thought it was going to be something else, but great. Yeah, uh, the near field communication chips are a subset of the kind of chips that you put, uh, you put in your dog, for instance. Uh, but those chips are a passive chip that is uh, has to be excited by a magnetic field. It uses induction to uh, right. excite the chip, and then it, it, it shows its number. Um, near, near field communication chips are actually powered, so they and it has a two way conversation. So it, I, I just thought uh, I, I'm always excited about new things, and I'm particularly excited about new uh, security. Yeah, we need more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Right. Well, what are we? We're at 37 minutes. I bet people have gotten to where they're going to be. They're at work. They're in their car, having a moment, sipping their coffee with Rick and Eric. That's right. So and, you all uh, can tell us. You can tell us your feedback, right? Radio at GardenFork.tv is our email address. Yeah, always glad to hear from people. and Got some great uh, input on uh, some new shows or directions you can take the uh, uh, your videos. And so that's that's really helpful. If you have ideas, let us know. And if you, if you don't have any ideas, but you just kind of want to vote on things, uh, let us know about that too. Uh, there are a whole list uh, on the uh, YouTube video. Uh, what's it called? Sitting on the floor? Um, I can't remember. The t it's, the, it's one of the most recent ones in the channel right now. <laughs> yeah. But there are a whole bunch there in the comments. And so you can just kind of go through. And if you really you like that idea, them. yeah, give them a thumbs up. And uh, we'll see what we can uh, get turned out. There you go. All right. So thank you all for listening. Uh, as always, just uh, let me know your thoughts. If you're on iTunes, you want to give us a little review. That's always good. So go out and do cool stuff. And then let us know what you do. Thank you, okay. Rick. Okay. You bet. See you later, my friend. Garden Fork's theme music is used under license from uniquetracks.com. Uniquetracks.com.